Hi guys, and welcome to this week's uh, episode of the Life Switch Show. I'm your host, Adam Kavalik, and every week I go live with guests to get to share some of their stories, their switches in life, their tips and ideas and inspirational stories for you guys to take home so that you can make your own switches in life or even possibly careers and businesses. This week's guest is, uh, uh, is John Beckley, and we are talking about uh, low points, we're talking about materialistic focus, we're talking about money being the answer to all our suffering, or maybe not, and uh, what can happen when we shift our focus, our energy away from those things, and maybe more towards the things that truly matter in life. So, if you're joining on YouTube, uh, do not forget to uh, hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get notified when we go live, and of course, like uh, this this page. Also, if you're on Facebook watching this, uh, you can make sure to like my, my page, Adam Kavalek Life Coach. And also, if you're joining live, you can then comment on, on YouTube or on Facebook. That way, we can then address some of your questions and comments. All right, guys, catch you on the other side. Let's introduce John Beckley. Hey, hi, Adam. Can you hear me? I can't and hear you. there we go. I've got you. Yeah, yeah. Hi. <laughs> cool. <laughs> good. So welcome, John. Uh, how, how are you Thank today? You. Yeah, good. All good. Yeah. Yeah. So, perfect, day. So, perfect weather here in the Canary Islands. Yeah, exactly. And 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 for anyone who's, who's you know seen this before, uh, the studio is uh, ha have gotten a, a facelift. So we're we're uh, designing a few new things around here, which is really nice. Uh, and I, 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 this is the first time I'm seeing it. It's nice. It's great. Yeah, I'll and I'm super. There, so. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm super glad to have you on, uh, John. I, I really am. Uh, I mean, you're a friend, a good friend of mine, someone who I've gotten to know in the past year or so. And um, you know, when I asked you to come on board, it was really because you know this being a show about life switches and what I know from you, what you've shared with me. You've, done, you've made your own different switches in life and in careers. And one thing that really stood out for me, I think, is uh, this, this uh, conviction of staying true to yourself. I mean, you've, you've been able, you've been offered opportunities to, to take work somewhere, uh, to, to take on clients, do kind, all kinds of different things where sometimes that not haven't really been playing well with your values and what you stand for. And you've had the courage to say no to that and, and stay true to what you believe in. That I honor and I really, really appreciate. And that's one of the good reasons why I wanted you to be on the show. And I kind of wanted you to, you know, for anyone who's joining to introduce yourself and let, okay. let, let us know a little bit more about who you are, what you do. Okay. Let me uh, shoot. Um, so I came to, to Tenerife, Canary Islands uh, 20 years ago, and um, I started a website design company. And I bought a web designer from South Africa over, and we used to design these flash websites with the airplane going across the top. In the beginning, it was like everyone was wow, and we were doing so well with that. And then we figured out that the Alta Vista was the search engine then that everyone used. It couldn't index those. So we suddenly figured out we have to drop all of that at with Flash. And we became kind of an SEO company where we used to focus on ranking search uh, websites in the search engines. And then obviously when social media came along, I got involved in social media purely from an SEO point of view um, because it was helping with our business like that. And then I kind of got sucked into social media, which is really where I am today. It's just, it's it's all kind of stayed in social media that I'm working in. Um, but yeah, so I'm here. Um, <clears throat> we're going to discuss uh, my pivot from from this into my Canary Island screen. But basically, mm -hmm. I've been here for 20 years, and I've come through the digital marketing uh, field. Mm. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, that's right. I mean, because that's been the one thing that you've you've been quite consistent with this digital marketing background and, and environment, right? Yeah. I, I read um, Seth Godin's book, uh, Business at the Speed of Thought. And mm. I think that was in two, th and he said, 
everything in business is going to become digital. And he started, mm. he was actually not, that was before smartphones or anything came out. Mm. And he was talking about wearable devices that will talk to each other, that will, so I was blown away with how he was talking and I really saw this as the future, um, mm. which really it is. Eh? And if we want to see where yeah, it's it became. going, it's, it's just getting stronger, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So, all right, so, okay, we, we, we got a few things. There are many things that I would love to get into. And before we do, um, so I, I, something that I've noticed about you is that, as you said with Seth Godin, Seth Godin, for anyone who, who's, who's uninitiated, he's a marketing guru. Uh, there are plenty of books out there that you should definitely read. And he's got a beautiful blog as well. Uh, really powerful uh, dude. And one thing that I know about you is that you seem to be picking up on these trends. Like you, you, you have this, I don't know, sixth sense. Uh, I mean, because you heard Seth Godin talk about that and you just like, oh, wow, that's the future. Yeah. A lot of people did and they still didn't get on board. How, how come, like, what's that about? Like, is that something, are you always open to change or is that yeah, a think, personality trait? Yeah, yeah. I think I've always just uh, been looking ahead where it's moving, how it's moving. Um, and it's not so much about technology. It's about how it influences people and how people are moving and commun it's a change in the way we communicate basically um, all this that's happening at the moment and um, if you look at I've got a 17 year old daughter and a 12 year old son and if you look at the, the way they communicate with their friends it's so fast it's it makes us mm. look like amateurs <laughs> the way we communicate <laughs> with each other yeah yeah, yeah. that's absolutely <laughs> true I remember it's funny that you said that because I remember I, uh, I studied theater, dance and theater in school. And um, my my teacher, she was kind of like an idol to me. She was a theater uh, teacher and she'd actually lived in China uh, where she toured with a dance group. And like she was a puppet, uh, puppeteer kind of thing, but not with strings, but actual like hands. She, she, okay. and she was really famous for it, which is really weird. But anyway, and I remember I shared with her at one point, like I, I love movies in general. And I'd watched Moulin Rouge, Buzz Lerman's Moulin Rouge. I yeah. love that movie. I still do. I've watched it probably 18 times. And I don't, I'm not kidding. I, I probably watched it 18 times. And I told her that, like, wow, it's such a beautiful movie. We should make something, you know, make our own version of that on, on stage. And she told me, yeah, I don't really like that movie. It's just, it, it makes me dizzy. It makes me feel like dizzy. And I was like, what? Really? Said, yeah, it's, it's just too much, it's too fast transitions and, and, and clips and things happening. I'm like, oh, that's, that's really weird. And then at one point, I, I do not know why, but I came home drunk, really drunk one night. And for whatever reason, I felt, yeah, what a good idea to watch uh, Moulin Rouge. So I put it on, on my DVD and started watching it. And because I had some alcohol in my body, I realized that I couldn't I couldn't follow along because it was just too many fast paced uh, uh, clips and, and, and cuts. And that's when it hit me like, oh, this is this is what she must have meant. Like she couldn't enjoy the movie because it was too distracting. Yeah. That that thing has always stayed with me when I see, you know, my nephew, like, you know, six years old playing with social media or YouTube or whatever. It's that fast. Like, I, I don't get it. Snapchat or reels like now i sound super old but to me <laughs> that is strange but i don't on get the, it. On, on, the, on the other side of that coin is you have the older generation that it's this is too fast you know and everything's yes. moving too fast for them so they they've got this fear of change of what's mm. coming they want it back in a conservative way of how we used to do things and um it is a bit scary the way it's changing but um yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I can see that. I can see that. And, it, and yet it's so funny because, like, I guess that every generation will have their, you know, their way of, of, of dealing with this. Like, I often think about my grandfather. He, he, he got to be 94, born 1922. That man, he saw it all. Exactly. Everything. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, cars getting really popular on streets and phones and electricity and indoor plumbing, all kinds of things. DVDs, CDs you know, uh, smartphones, he even had a smartphone at the end of it. I mean, that is just crazy how much he saw. 
there's a futurist called uh, Leonard, and he was saying that in this 20-year period, humanity is going to change more than in the last 300 years. So that's incredible. Wow. Right? If, if we say, and I think digital and social media and the way we communicate is, and the way we're getting education now, is just going to be uh, speeding everything up. So, yeah. uh, And that's an interesting point. I mean, especially when we see... Now, I, I, I'm, I'm not super into this, but when you see the, the homeschooling going around right now because of COVID, where we have these remote learning platforms, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see developments around that. Yeah, um, oh, time, yeah. Right, well, and, and, and also... Yeah. Before about this, about, about this change in education, and um, not just for schools, even for adults, you know, to be in this like, constant state of learning, and now it's so easy, so... Precisely. Yeah. And I heard something about universities, like there might be this, this situation <laughs> where, you know, normally people pay these uh, tuitions, these really expensive tuitions to go to university. And it, it, it's almost a, a, a class, uh, you know, issue. And now because of this remote um, possibility, we're opening up the world and people get to like, hmm, why should I be paying this much tuition if I can do this from home? not needing to go to a campus and all kinds of things. But equally, Yale offered a free course on mm -hmm. happiness. And, and I got my daughter, and I did it, yeah. Um, yeah. During, during lockdown. So, and, and inside that, it had meditation tasks and, and other things. But um, it was free, you know, and this was from yeah. Yale University. Yeah. So it, was, uh, it just shows you that you can really kind of embrace it and move along with it in a, in a different way. Yeah, I do like that. I do like that. So, I do, uh, yeah, sorry. yeah, what, what was that? No, but yeah, I, do no, I, was I, I do understand that there's a, a resistance to change. I understand mm -hmm. people that didn't grow up, like I didn't grow up with digital. I got my first email when I was 24 years old. So, mm -hmm. uh, and that was here. So when I was studying marketing and business management in South Africa, we weren't doing anything digital, nothing on the computer. So, um, yeah. yeah. But at, at the same time, like you got on to this, you know, change and, and you, you've been on that trajectory of change quite easily for most of your life. Like you, yeah. you're not as resistant to change, are you? Or No, no. It, it, well, there's certain things, hey, like uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm always, I'm always when like I, I have coffee in the same place every single morning. You know, if you okay, say to yeah. me, go and try another place with a <laughs> cup of tea, I'm going, no, no, I want my coffee. So in some things in my life, I'm really, you know, that's how I want it. Um, Creatures of habits. But, yeah. yeah, but in terms of business, in terms of um, communi communicating of anything digital, I'm, I'm up for it, yeah. Yeah, that's, I like that. And we, I kind of want to come back to that, I guess, uh, as, as we go deeper into this conversation, because I think it's, it is definitely an important piece of, you know, building business, uh, education, connecting, uh, and, and creating movements. And I, I think you've got a few things to say about that. Now, when when I asked you to to be a guest, um, you shared with me some, you know, you, some of the things that, as I said in the introduction here, that you used to have a focus on you know, materialistic desires, uh, money, thinking that that, you know, more money equals better things, I guess. Um, and at one point, you kind of got that insight of, um, you know, to refocus your energy towards the things that truly matters in life. Yeah. Is there anything you can, you know, expand on that and share a little bit about what that meant well, for you? I, mean, I went through like so many people now, just conditioned. Society has just conditioned us to go and study, get a piece of paper that tells you you qualify to do this, and then go and work as hard as you can to make as much money to buy a house, to mm. buy a car, to have, you know, the cat and the dog. And, and just, and I did all that. You know, I had a company. I used to dress in a suit every day. We were paying a fortune in rental you know, our office was next to lawyers. So we were paying prime rent, but we were getting the business. And, and there was so much stress. There was so much everything. And um, I mean, I know in the, in the profile of this talk, you mentioned that I went through divorce um, from working too much. I then lost my brother. I lost uh, my mother. And all in a very short period of time. And obviously, it's, that's time for reflection and time for rethinking 
life and and what are you doing here and it was a chance for me to reassess what i'm working for because i've always been you know whether i'm helping clients with digital marketing it's always on the profit motive it's always through the prism of how much money can we make mm. like if you look at all the stats we're looking at it's to do with conversion rates volume profit uh and then i just didn't i just didn't feel i wanted to be doing that anymore and um, yeah. obviously this coincided with um the european union bringing out their latest climate change report where they were talking about that humanity has to drastically change over the next 12 years uh and i was like after 2 years of the, after that report came out hey no one's doing anything like the house <laughs> is on fire and no one's <laughs> no one's changing so as i started kenevi green which was a sustainable non-profit um uh, company and uh, getting the paperwork and getting everything going really dragged out and of course then we hit into covid so it's it's been tough going but the idea is that um i feel good about what i'm doing it's something bigger than me it's not about uh having this kind of car to show off or this uh, so i i do really feel good inside myself i'm feeling motivated i'm i'm pumped and it's not easy that's the it's not like everything fell into place and and it was like swimming down a current you know it wasn't if anything is swimming against the current yeah <laughs> that's a that's a good analogy yeah. yeah yeah so we got a question from andrea she she asked you uh and i i assume that it was it was for um <laughs> for john what was your biggest ch change in life you'd say i think for me losing my brother was something that was a catalyst of what am i doing you know what am mm. i doing like just waking up and going into work it was really really tough for me so i think if i have to you know my mother passed away after that and that was really tough but she was old and and um and she accepted you know i went i flew to south africa and i said goodbye to her and and so it was more I, I could deal with it better whereas my brother like died suddenly and then i saw him you know in the in the in the morgue and and that was really tough for me and um, mm -hmm. i think if i think of everything of a, a thought process it kind of changed from that moment uh, mm. yeah and did so that, that like did that event or those events together did they play a role in that whole thing around the sustainability uh, report or was well, that I, always an interest? Well, I, I I I met up with a guy called Simon that was very sustainable minded, and um, and and then of course uh, with other people from the Canary Green team. So uh, these guys have all influenced me a lot as well uh, on this path of change. And mm. it's you know from eating less meat to uh, recycling to you know not uh, being more minimalistic, not f focusing on. Um, buying more clothes more shoes more you know everything like it so, mm. yeah so i mean if we back up a bit because you how you you really said something super interesting i think interesting when you when you started talking about conditioning you know that we are we're almost instantly conditioned to you know go through school with a certain mindset and as soon as you hit the uh you know the what do you call that the work force or whatever you're supposed to work in a certain way work hard hustle 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 all those things what like i mean you've got you've got a daughter yourself and a son yep. growing up now what what could you say to someone being you know in school right now 15 16 17 years old and of, of course they're being conditioned as well in certain ways what would be a thing that you could say to them that you wish that you would have known as you were getting out and, and getting a job and building a life for yourself? Well, I think the main thing is not to, I think everyone's just that first step in life is to go into study for university and everyone thinks they have to do that. And I don't think you have to do that. Um, I think it's about your ability to have teamwork, to be self-motivated, to be mindful, to all of these things really become important. And we're not teaching this stuff in school. So I would say to young people, even like my daughter gets so fed up of me <laughs> talking about this, but um, it it is to embrace not this, the piece of paper you're going to get, but life experiences. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always encouraging you to travel, to try the Erasmus for Entrepreneur program, which is... Uh, which he's going to do uh, 
and just embrace all of these things that are all about experiences at this stage of life. So if you're leaving school now at 17, it's not about the piece of paper. It's about educating yourself and in kind of new rules. So it's, it's everything to do with where everything's heading, like in sustainability, in digital, in, um, because I just think computers are going to take over a lot of these jobs. We're trying to condition our kids into going into and, um, you know, I'm really worried that uh, we always joke that they announced in Singapore that they're changing all the buses to automated buses. There's going to be no more bus drivers. So I said to my friend, I'm so glad I'm not a bus driver in Singapore. And so that's a standing joke now. Jeez, I'm glad I'm not a bus driver in Singapore because they said in 2020 they're changing all the buses. And that's yeah. that's now. So, yeah. 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 I, I think that's a real, um, it's a real issue no I, I don't want to say an issue because i think there is something good about that that we can actually open up a possibility around that but it's a real thing to face um and i think personally i think school is is playing catch up with with the development of um, of late yeah if you look at all these modern companies that are coming to look at google facebook all mm. of them kind of dropped out of university, went into the garage. And what is the most common thing with all of them is they had creative freedom. They were there with no rules, no, yeah. no boxes around them to say, you've, you can't do it like that. You've got to do it like this. And you've got to yeah. hand it in by this time. It wasn't. Mm. It was just freedom. And, it was, and that's where I think we need to head with regards to renewable energy, sustainable living, is this kind of freedom, not box it and, and, and let's uh, put all these rules around it. Because I think that's when humanity is its most creative. And, and, and you know, we cornered now. COVID and, and climate change have kind of coincided to, hey, guys, it's all coming apart. It's not, we cannot just carry on the way we've been going for the last few years. I like that. I mean, to me, what you just said, I mean, someone could hear that as something like, oh, God, uh, you know, the house is on fire. I hear, wow, what an opportunity. What an invitation. Can you speak to that a little bit, like COVID, and you know what what have been your what has been your um, experience with that? What do you see as a possible uh, um, a possibility from that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, if you think about these conf these webinars now and Zoom, this was all yeah ten years ago, mm. and and we were no one is using it, no businesses. Well, there was a very small percentage using it, so I think COVID is going to change everything much faster than, than it would have happened anyway. But mm. I think what COVID, when we look back in history, we're going to say this was a catalyst for change, rapid change in the way we do business, working from home, studying from home. Universities are going to have to rethink themselves. So education, um, I think COVID is also going to make us think about our diets, about um, everything. It, it's, it's just going to... So I think all these businesses sitting there going... Let's go back to business as usual. I think they're going to be, uh, but out of out of this, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity, a lot of um, creativeness, and I think it's quite exciting times. I don't think it's something we should fear. We should embrace it, and 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 say, how can we how can we get out of this? How can we do it to, together? You know. Yeah. I remember some people in my team were talking about if we. If we don't have the support to promote hydrogen cars coming to the Canary Islands, it's a crime against humanity. You know, it's like, and I love that because that's how we should be looking at this is, is that yeah. we embrace it. It's, yeah. uh, I think yeah. when humanity is put in its, its most vulnerable position, we should bounce out of it and show who we are and how creative we are rather than yeah. fearing it and trying to hold on to something else that, that just we're never going to go back to. I like that because it's it's speaking to the best in us versus the the fear or the smallest of us. Mm. I like that. I, I I like that focus. We got I a think, question. Yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah. No. No. Another question. <laughs> we we got a question from Agata. She uh, she was asking about uh, how you John see the future of uh, uh, Tenerife. Do you see us moving from a mass tourism to digital economy, or what are your thoughts on that? Well. I think, like everything, um, Tenerife is going to have to rethink what they're doing. Because again, if you remember the traffic here in Tenerife before COVID, it was mm. getting unbelievable. In fact, the Los Cristianos intersection was the busiest in Spain. And mm. we, yeah, so we take on average 15 million people coming into the Canary Islands. And mm. I think it's not sustainable. 
and we're building more hotels now. More five-star hotels are being built. So it's not, I think even if the airport was taking planes 24 seven, we still couldn't fill all the hotel beds we're building. So it doesn't make sense what we're doing. And um, I think it needs to head more towards experience driven and more sustainable. So responsible tourism, where mm. we can talk more about like kayaking, not jet skis, but kayaking, not dune buggies, but hiking. Uh, so we start thinking about everything in those terms. Is it good for the planet? Is it good for the animals and the marine life? Uh, and then we have the hotels, the activity planners, everyone embracing this kind of um, new style. Because if you think about the air and how clean the water is, and we four hours flight from, from Europe. So what we should be marketing ourselves as is don't go to Florida or to Bali, but come here because it's, it's less emissions, but you're still getting the sun and this, this here in, on the Canadian yeah. line. So I think mass tourism, no, we have to bring it down to uh, responsible tourism, we need to get the community back into this to support local business so it becomes more sustainable uh, for us. Mm. Yeah. That's a good point. Now, you mentioned um, to, um, to not go jet skiing, but rather canoeing or kayaking. What, what makes you say that, you know, pick this before that? Well, because um, we went on a boat trip called Biosan, and he mm. studies uh, Michel, a really great guy. He studies uh, the marine life, and he was talking about the ferry crossings and the boats and the engines mm. and the jet skis that are – the jet skis are searching, and then they're staying with these whales and dolphins to look at them and to – and it's harassing them, and it's, it's affecting their breeding habits and all of those kind of things. Whereas when you're snorkeling and you're kayaking – um, you can engage and 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 look and appreciate nature, but but just not in a in a harmful way. You know where it's where it's affecting. I mean, I I think why I wanted to ask that because I I, I kind of I hoped I, I knew the answer to it, but I think that is such an important thing because you know when I came to the island and and even you know engaging with you and Canary Green, that's when I started thinking about oh hang on there's you know, even having that conversation around sustainable tourism, because it's easy when you're on a holiday to just, you know, eat well, drink well, enjoy it and, and, and have the best day of your life. And that can sometimes entail very, you know, drastic uh, activities. As you said, uh, jet ski it could be um, these uh, be, um, sand buggies kind of things. But and in reality, they just leave a lot of they they make such a big noise in nature, and they 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 leave such a track in yeah. you know in in nature. Yeah, and I think it's just something that we but these other, to forget. I, th I think because everything is coinciding now, we can do things like go up to a local finca and plant trees where you've got your name on it that's, that somehow stays with the tree until it grows up and you can come back to it in 20 years' time and have a look at it. But you do it as a family. So you have your daughter there. And, yeah. and then I think parents, especially younger millennials, are kind of wanting to do these kind of things rather than um, uh, let's go to the water park and, and slide down. So it's also part of education and it's part mm. of sustainability and, and all those kind of things, yeah. Like even now at one hotel, which I advise for Pearly Gray, is we're talking about um, going to the local biological farm and they can taste the fruit, they can have a mm. tour around the farm, they explain how it works, uh, they can order a vegetable box to come back and, and, and cook in their kitchen. So all of these things are just changing the activities and the mindset. And a lot of business owners are thinking, but my clients don't want that. But I think we could attract a whole different kind of market that really want to come here because we are that. So if we rebrand ourselves and reach channel our energies towards a sustainable tourist destination, I think a lot of people will want to come because of that. Not, not, um, but I think having that holiday maker coming here for cheap beer and sun and, and behaving in a way that that's not sustainable. That's not who we are. I think, um, we can we can be better than that. And I to that point, I think you're absolutely right. I think sometimes that can be because I, I was on a call very very just before we got on this this show today, and on that call I was talking to a, a person about this that I, I I have this conviction that when we feel better we do better, and I think we do that in general. And sometimes you talked about being conditioned, you know, through school and and, and the workforce and kinds of things. 
I think that conditioning sometimes, the outcome, the result of that can be that we live a life that is not necessarily the life we want to live. It's like, it's almost like living misaligned with our purpose. Now, I'm not saying this is for everyone, but people, we, we know who, who's, who's it for. Like, you feel this. You feel this because you probably feel shitty or depressed. Uh, you feel out of sync with how things are. If that's you, I'd say, you know, that's an imitation for you to re-examine what is going on in your life. How are you living life? And how is this maybe not for you? And because what I've noticed is, and this used to be me a lot. This is why I resonate so much with your story around the materialistic desires and the money and stuff. I used to be super addicted to shopping. Like I, I, I remember, you know, when I met Andrea, she said like, you've got more shoes than most women do. And <laughs> that was actually true. Sneakers and exercise equipment, all kinds of things technical uh, gadgets and phones and computers, all kinds of stuff. I used to do this, like I used to buy a lot of stuff because that was all I could do with the money I was making because I was just miserable and didn't have time to do anything else. Yeah. So I can see if someone's living a life very similar to what I just briefly described in my own case, how going on a vacation once every year, two weeks out of the year, just to you know, let go, go crazy. I can see how that makes sense. And I want to say a lot of times, like if you, if you felt good most of the, the year, maybe that wasn't necessary. Maybe you'd feel so stable, so calm, so centered that when you do go to a beautiful place like Tenerife, you go, let's go plant a tree. I, I want to leave something rather than take something away. Exactly. Yeah. I think, that's and I think, it, you know, the mindset yeah okay cool so we're getting a, a, a comment in uh, so unfortunately we need money to live pay bills etc what would you do if you could live completely without making money oh that's a that's an interesting question I I'm gonna you know John I'm gonna assume that's uh, that's yeah. a question for you to play with well um... I'm in the, I've got Canary Green where I'm working in sustainability, tourism. Uh, I, I make zero money out of it. And I've been doing it for three years and it sucks yeah. so much of my energy. Um, so I'm, I'm living that now. But I, I am a realist. I, I'm, I'm working with a hotel. I'm working with a golf course. I'm working with a, a, a real estate agent. And I advise them. I help them make videos. I do a lot of things like that in SEO for them. And so I'm doing it like that. But I think as a society, if we're all thinking in the same way towards sustainability, I think it will help. And also, I think we should all change to start thinking more about uh, working together, not always looking at everything, even brands. Even me as a nonprofit, people are looking at me as a comp competitor. Mm -hmm. And I don't look at it like that. I think we should all be this. We're all in here for humanity, for a better future. That's why we're here. And so we should be working together and, and co-promoting. And uh, I think that's where we need to be heading. So if everyone's starting to think this, that's where the business is. That's where business will evolve into. And I think if businesses want to stay, it's going to be like Blockbuster. They stay in their, their field. But you've got, to, you've got to get the timing right. I know we can't all, I can't just work with Canary Green now because I've got to pay my rent. I've got to pay my, my car. I've got to, you've got to pay your bills. Yeah, so it's, it's trying to, it's it. What comes first? You've 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 got to um, yeah get the balance right. Yeah, and I I think that I mean that could even like if we got to rewind, we could have easily spent the whole episode talking about that. I think because it's such an interesting topic. I think that <clears throat> you know there is a quote out there. I can't remember who said it or where it's from, and I, I'm going to butcher it as well. But it's it's something about like being rich is not about how much you have but how little you need something like that and to me my transition from being extremely materialistically driven and focused oriented um to what i i started calling myself a minimalist and then i realized that wasn't actually serving me so i became an optimalist which is kind of like what's optimal versus what's minimal because i don't think you <laughs> again you don't have to live on nothing. I don't think that's what we're saying. What we're saying is what's optimal for you. 
Yeah. And that's the conversation. That's the mindset to have. What's optimal for you? And I figured that out. I personally, I figured that out. What what, what that was for me. And I've noticed that knowing and which, which again, is is why I wanted you to be on the show because when you told me that story, or, you know, gave me that that um, you know that that angle of how you can refocus your energy on things that matter. I think that is so important because it's our job. It's yeah. our job to figure that out. And yeah. once we know, you get to pursue that. Yeah. And, because, and, yeah. yeah. Sorry. No, Karen. No, no. no, I'll just say, we spoke about this before and we were talking about perception. Hey, it, and everything, yeah. if you've got two people looking at the same thing, it's about perception. Yeah. And I always go back to my daughter because she's like, I want to go and get a, I want to study, then I want to get a job and I'm going to make this money. And boo, she's all pumped. And I said to her, don't, don't, Look at it from the money, because if we go to Beijing, and I've told you the story before, and there's a millionaire there, and he's working 14-hour days, and he's got all these millions, and he's wearing a mask because there's so much smog, and he, that's his life. And I said to my daughter, you living in Alcala, in the harbor, where you walk out there, and you've got your friends there, you can see the water at the bottom because it's so clean and clear you living the millionaire's lifestyle because if that chinese guy in beijing could see you living like that he would go oh my god i would pay anything to live that lifestyle so it's all about perception yeah. so if we can work on our perceptions and then um, uh, learn to appreciate experiences and moments rather than materialistic uh, gains yeah yeah i mean it's, it's it, that reminds me of the Mexican fisherman, the story. You, you probably heard it. So there's this story, and anyone listening right now, I'm sure you... you re I, I bring this up quite a bit. Um, but it's easy. You can find it on YouTube. There's like a three or four minute clip. There's longer, longer versions as well, but it's easy enough. And it's a Mexican fisherman where it's like this uh, rich banker from, from America goes on holiday into Mexico somewhere. There's a fishing village. And one early morning, he sees this Mexican fisherman coming in and uh, he looks So the American banker, he looks into the boat of the fisherman and goes like, not a good catch today because he only sees these three big fish. And the Mexican says, yeah, yeah, yeah it was it was good. Oh, but you're, you're only having, you know, you only have three fish. No, no, it was a, it was a good day. It's all I need, he says. Mm -hmm. And the banker said, well, OK, what do you mean with that? Well, with this, I get to feed my family. That's all I need. And the banker goes, oh, so what do you do for the rest of the day? Oh, for the rest of the day, I, I take a siesta, you know, I sleep, sleep, I have a nice time. I play with my kids and make love with my wife. I play some guitar and in the evenings I go down to the bar and have a beer with my friends and we laugh and then I go back home and tomorrow I wake up early and I, I catch myself three fish. And, and the banker goes like, what? No, no, listen, listen, I've got, I've got a, you know, I've studied business. I know what you should do. You should stay out a little longer and catch more fish. And the surplus you can sell at the market. And with the money, you can buy a bigger boat. Yeah. And the fisherman goes like, oh, yeah, and, and then what? And then with that bigger boat, you can catch more fish. And with more fish, you can start selling directly to the, the fa uh, factories. And, and the story goes on and on. And this banker basically tells the story of how to get like a, a like publicly traded and move to Wall Street, move to New York. And then, you know, then at the end of it all, 25 years down the line, you can retire with millions. You can move down to a Mexican fisher village and you can enjoy the day, take a siesta with your wife, play guitar with your friends and have a beer at the pub. And he realizes, oh, crap, he's that's his life right now. Yeah. And I think. That is, you know, again, figure out what matters to you is yeah. the point. Yeah. In, in, in Swedish, we have a saying, which I think is it's much shorter than a Mexican fisherman, and it works very well. And it's, it's kind of like this. Don't cross the stream to get water, which means you, you can get water on this side as well. Don't cross it to get water. It's unnecessary. Yeah. And I think it's the same thing. But I think a lot of people are thinking like this, but what do I do? How do I, how do I take these steps Mm. Uh, because I mean, obviously, I hit kind of a, a bottom place, and 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 changed. But you don't have to do that, you know. In your mm. lives, you can make changes. Um, and I, I would definitely say, I mean, I had a, a life coach, uh, Else. She's a lady from Belgium, and she helped me um, come to, to put my energy into Canary Green. And um, because I didn't want to be working and just making money, and it was about that 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 change and mm. and pivot in in your life to 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 feel so much more rewarded. And I wouldn't go back 
Uh, there's no way I would go back to a nine to five job where I'm getting stressed, but making a lot more money. I feel so good. You know, so many people are so supportive about Canary Green and, and you know, even people donating a few euros means that so much to me. Uh, and you really appreciate those kind of things um, mm. more than I was doing when I was making lots of money and, and stressed yeah. with employing so many more people and, and trying to employ more people to get more money to get. And like you're saying, for what? Where, where does it finish with, with all of it? Mm. Yeah. Like Adam, t today, today I've booked golf for tomorrow. If yeah. you'd gone back five years and said, John, you're just going to start playing golf during midweek? No. And now I'm playing <laughs> golf. Why? Because I work so hard. I work on weekends. I love my job. No one's telling me hours. So I work in the mm. evenings or this. But what I've said to myself, especially this year, is if the coach wants to play paddle with you, if your friends want to play golf and they can only make this time, do it. So um, I'm making concerted efforts to get that a bit of balance because I'm also a bit of a workaholic, I think, like you. And, and so <laughs> we're, always, we're, always, we're always connected, we're always working. So, um, yeah. No, that's, that's a, such a good point. I mean, and, and I think this is Simon Sinek. He talks about this, you know, Simon Sinek, the why guy. He talks about um, <clears throat> you feel work stress when you work for an organization or a cause you don't believe in. Passion is what you feel when you believe in what you do. And I think that's extremely true a lot of times when you're, you know, in business of, for your own or, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you're running something, especially when you're running a nonprofit. I think that it's almost a prerequisite. Like you need to have that fire. Um, and, and, and when we do that, again, when we're tapped into this passion, this drive, this purpose and reason, it it just fuels. So, it, you know, yeah. you, I actually work longer days these days and I work more days. And I used to cl complain, oh, I used to work so much for Ikea and I burnt out. I did that. You know what? I actually work harder and longer these days, yeah. but it doesn't feel like it yeah. because I get to enjoy it because I now believe, truly believe in what I do. Yeah. And, you know, like I, I played rugby my whole life since I was nine, nine years old. And when I was in South Africa, I was playing quite good level um, club rugby. And um, I got dropped to the second team and we started winning all of our games. But we had mm. such team spirit. Everyone was on the same mission. It was like, it wasn't just turning up to play a game of rugby. It was like we were mates. We all had a beer together afterwards. And the first team were losing all of their games. But they never stayed for a beer afterwards. Some of the players were paid quite big money to play. And then they thought they were better than the other ones. Whereas our team had it like that. And then what they did is they thought, oh, well, let's promote all of us in the second team to the first team and we'll get that winning solution. And we never did because it wasn't about this. this yeah. Like we, our passion is all together going forward in the same direction. And uh, yeah. yeah, that's a good story. That makes a lot of sense. Mm. Now, you, you were talking about that, like, um, well, well, at least I'm interested in this. This is something when I met you and you started talking about personal branding as as a way to maybe move towards this new future of our hours, um, that the world is kind of changing in terms of how we get a job and what we might actually do as an occupation in the future. And, and you have this spin on like for me, when I started working as a coach and coaching entrepreneurs, I, I often came to work with entrepreneurs. Uh, I often often um, worked with uh, uh, even influencers. I thought that, you know, you're either an influencer or you're not. And if you're an influencer, you're successful, you're lucky. But your spin, your take on personal branding, I, I'd love for you to talk about that a bit. Well, I think we shouldn't call it personal branding because I hate that term. So it's about your <laughs> reputation online and it's about... Uh, I mean, I remember my friend Renee said, can she come and work for me for free? And I said, what? So she said, I'd, I sent my CV to every single company in Tenerife, 2,000 companies. And she said, not one answered me. She said, I'm so demoralized. I'm so depressed. And then she came to me and I said, listen, let's put all your profiles together online. Let's, when I Google your name, what comes up? If I don't know who you are, what do I think of you? Where would you like to work? What sector? So we kind of worked on these programs and then she connected. Then she got offered a job uh, in London. And it actually turned out that she could go to a home country in Lithuania and run their Erasmus for Entrepreneurs program for them. And she was so happy. She was so thankful. And I think there's so many people sending CVs out. 
And I think the way we're communicating, the way we, uh, I mean, even now, I was, I was listening to a stat saying that the, the computers are now looking at the CVs and they will only actually move aside 3% of CVs coming in. Mm. So when you're sending your CV out, it's 3% chance it's going to be looked at by someone. And even then, mm. it, the, it drops down. So this whole way of like presenting your profile online, and it's not about getting a job, it's about your whole career. So you start thinking about yourself like, this is me always. I might be doing this now, and maybe in the near future I'm doing something else, but this is me. And then running with that for your whole career. And, and stop thinking about social media. Think about of a, as a change in the way we communicate and your reputation online. So, because often now people say, oh, but John, you've got all these recommendations on LinkedIn and all these connections. Look at me, I've got 15. I said, but I started with 15. I didn't even know what I was doing when I started. It wasn't like a, whereas now you know that this is what I'm doing. So if you want to work in sustainability, go and follow sustainable companies. Go and follow human resources of sustainable companies. Go and do, upskill yourself in learning. So in my course that I'm preparing now with creative job hunting, mm. I'm talking about being in a constant state of learning and upskilling yourself. And you can do this for free now. There's several things which I talk about, um, like creating lists on Twitter. So, for example, in digital marketing and social media, I follow the top 100 people, and I get their take on everything that's happening. Um, Feedly is another one where you take the RSS feed of a blog and you put it into a Feedly reader. So I just open up one app, and I've got all the articles feeding in there. Um, creating YouTube playlists that you can watch later. So, um, and subscribing to channels that you want to get information from. Because now, Adam, if you think about it, everyone's publishing everything. The universities are publishing. Look at you publishing videos. Mm. We, we don't have to pay. It's a lot of this content's out there. You can get this information for free. But you've mm. got to decide, where do I want to go? How do I want to present myself? How do I stand out to be different? Because that's the problem, is, is, is these companies that want to employ someone, they just don't know who they're looking at. So you need to help them. You need to show show the best side of you. So okay, yeah. I mean, so you're talking about this creative job hunting course. Why is it called creative job hunting? How is it different from ordinary job hunting? You think? Well, because I think it's not that I'm giving you anything creative. It's I want you to think different. You know, it's mm -hmm. the same as when I'm dealing with a brand and they trying to attract different people. You can't be the same as everyone else. You know, I was working for one of the top hotels here, consulting for them, and they actually pulled up the Instagram of the Ritz-Carlton, uh, Sheraton, all these top brands, and they said, look, and now look at ours. And I said, but that's the whole point. I don't want to be like them. They're all the same. They lost. They're all mixed together. If I showed you a bedroom, you couldn't tell me if that was the Ritz-Carlton or if that was the Sheraton. And so... Everything about being different and standing out applies to your personal brand, your personal reputation and how you, you come. And then there's other things, Adam, like now because we're moving to this digital world, everything's now Zoom calls. Every, mm. Your job interview is now through this. So mm. do you have, I know my lighting's not good today, but <laughs> do, do you have good lighting? <laughs> do, do you have good audio? Have you researched the company before? Do you have questions yeah. for them? All these things you need to be switched on. If you say you're going to send something to them, to back up from the meeting, make sure you do it. Mm -hmm. Because in my experience of employing people and working with people, they really let you down with being on time, sending the stuff through. And now because it's digital, they will take you or leave you very quickly. Yeah. And this, this applies for online dating as well. So you can use that also. Yeah. <laughs> so people just got, you know, how to get a job and a date or a partner. Well, That's I'm brilliant. Not sure, I'm not sure I should advise on the dating, but, but yeah. Uh, That's good. Now, but I like this. I, I, I like that. I especially like how you said that it's not that I'm giving you something creative. It's that I'm making, helping you think differently around this. Yeah. That I think is, is it, I mean, if, if you're going back to the whole idea about being conditioned, I think what you just brought up now helps to recondition, rewire some of that thinking in terms of like, right, the CV and it needs to look like this and, you know, recommendations, references, da, 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 da. What I'm taking from this is that you're going to go in and help people think differently and, and, and stand out and, and create their own reputation. So one of the, um, I was at the IBTM, which is a big uh, conference in um, Berlin. And I went there and there was a guy from Barcelona's uh, design agency that was talking. 
And he said, he gave us a story and it just stuck with me. And I said, that's bloody brilliant. And what he was saying is he was driving his car on the motorway and saw this kid doing graffiti art on the side of a bridge. Mm. And he said it was flipping brilliant. He stopped the car, went over there and offered him a job. And he said in three years, this guy dropped out of school when he was 14. Within four years, he was head of his design agency. And within six years, he had been headhunted by the biggest agency in Europe. This is how he told the story. And mm. it was this guy's teamwork skills, his his way to... to um, uh, creatively direct big projects was incredible. And the problem what he was talking about is so many times we're looking at the piece of paper that's coming out at the end of a university and so many of these guys are by the bridge. And I think yeah. even Google and these other guys are coming out saying, um, we're not just going to be looking at people with a degree anymore. We're going to be looking at other skill sets or... Um, because if I Good think point. about my marketing and business management course, no. If you look at all the small courses I've done since then for free, yes, I've <laughs> learned so much from, like even watching your videos where you're getting a good nugget of information and you take it with you. I'm not getting a piece of paper to say, Adam taught me this. No. Mm. So it's not about a piece of paper. It's about doing what you do and knowing how to do it and and, and then showing it, not being so hung up on oh, I don't like the way I look on video because no one cares. So, so you have to be able to come out there and, uh, and be yourself and be more honest. Yeah. And I think people yeah. feel better about themselves. I remember well, they, they were saying to me, oh, like my daughter especially says, Dad, I can get you so many more Instagram followers if you just did this and that. And I said, no, I'm not doing <laughs> Like, If you want to be an influencer and you need to have a lot of followers and that, then that's your line. I, I use it like an agenda, a uh, agenda. Uh, uh, a diary if you like mm. and so i put what's happening in my life almost you can see what i'm doing you'll probably see a golf photo tomorrow but yeah. th that's the way i use it. and i don't care i don't care how many likes i'm getting i don't look at it and go oh that didn't get any likes it's me it's 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 and i think we as a society need to become more honest more real mm. and stop getting hung up i mean instagram said they were going to do away with the like button and i think that's great that would be mm. the best thing ever yeah mm. And what, from, from your perspective, why is that a good thing, getting rid of the like button? Well, especially for the youth, it's killing us because these girls are taking 1,000 photos trying to get affirmation about themselves through likes. Hmm. We need to be deeper than that. We, you know, it's just as, a, as brands shouldn't be looking at that metric. Uh, real connections, real engagement, people that believe in your brand, people that are, that's where we want to go with all this stuff. So, so the metrics can still count, but let's put them to the back and not drive the, what we're doing and, mm -hmm. and make it real, make it what makes us human, you know, not, not likes and uh, views. And uh, I mean, this if you look at Gary, Gary V, I love Gary V because mm -hmm. Gary V came, he was the first one to come out and says, I don't care about lighting or, or this, I'm going to tell my story. And then mm -hmm. his, his mate was D rock. He's your James Tucker. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so he would, he would take that content and then splice it up, you know, and, and have it on, on Twitter or a catchphrase from Twitter. James, you can put this on Twitter if you want. Yeah. Or, or then he would put it on podcasts and then he would have, so he would have one bit of content and he would splice it up across everything. And if any film producer looked at that, they would say, your lighting's wrong. Your audio is not good. And look at that guy in the background going like this and, it, it wasn't perfect. And so I think we're moving away from that perfect stage mm. image into a real, let's be real, let's be honest, kind of. I think that's a great, that's a great um, point to kind of summarize that because I, I think, you know, a lot of times when we start talking about the online world and social media, a lot of times conditioning, again, it goes into, oh, perfectionism, like it needs to look a certain way. And what you're saying right now is that, no, actually, let's be more honest. Let's be more real. Let's, let's connect on a deeper level. Yeah. And I think that's, that's such a powerful message to have. Yeah. I was going to, with a friend and, um, to a meeting, and obviously we've been a year out in COVID. And she goes, I've got my high heels in my handbag because they were hurting me so much because I haven't worn them for so long. <laughs> and I said, don't put your high heels on. Just be easy. Yeah. But you know, and lipstick, you know, we've had the mask, a lot of ladies aren't wearing lipstick now, but 
are these going to be some of the changes with it where, where like women are saying hey i want to be comfortable i want to be i, I don't want to be i don't know i don't know yeah. i think it's yeah. all being uh we're, we're offered an opportunity i think to reevaluate things which is which is a really good thing i think yeah so all right so we're coming up on the the hour here uh i kind of want to ask you uh, one final question. I've, I've asked this a couple of times for some of the guests who's been on before. Like, if you could go back and you know, say that you meet yourself fifteen, you're fifteen years old, sixteen years old. What kind of advice could you give yourself that you wish that you would have known going forward? Does something come to your mind? Oh, yes, I said to <laughs> myself, I'm telling you, I'm vomiting all this stuff on top of you because I wish I could go back to myself and say don't get caught in this hamster wheel that you're just running and society's just tailored us to it. You know, just look at my diet. I wish I could go back and change my whole diet from the way I was eating. And mm -hmm. I just got sucked into all the stuff that was fast food, eat like this. And, and um, so I would go back and say, think for yourself, your body, you know, COVID's going to come up <laughs> down the line. Make sure you're strong. <laughs> Good point. You know, I Good. lost I lost a friend today on Facebook. Uh, he's not a friend. He's a guest from the the hotel that I know. Um, sixty five year old man, but he cycled at sixty five years old. He cycled from Kalasavaki to Tadi. That's over three thousand meters up, like this. Sixty five. I said to him, "You're a legend." And then he came and drank five, six pints of beer or whatever. I said, <laughs> "They don't make him like this anymore." Yeah. And he just passed away. Uh, a yeah. lovely, lovely man. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, that's the other thing COVID's teaching us is we have to appreciate uh, the moment. Hey? We have to we have to live and appreciate now. Yeah, I think that is it. I mean, as you said before, going back and and you know allowing ourselves to listen to what's right for us, you know, especially with diets and stuff like that. I have my my personal journey about that as well, so I, I know exactly what that means. And when you start leaning into what's right for you, it's like. It's so powerful. It's so important, and um, yeah, it's it, it's great advice. And it's it's you know it's. But if anyone's listening, there, I would say uh, if you're stuck and you want to pivot or um, make a change, is if you're struggling with it, get a life coach to help you. Mm. Adam, start with Adam, and if he's not good, then. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying, you know, I think because that's what helped me. You know, it yeah. helped me just. Um, you know, else was saying like, where were you five years ago? And she made me put a piece of paper on the floor and then mm -hmm. where are you today? And then where do you see yourself in five years time? And I was kind mm -hmm. of, when I looked at it, I was never talking to myself like that. And so when someone else just helped you get that perspective, you were able to make better decisions and, um, and also just bounce ideas off. So That's that would be the point. one people want to take away from this is. Uh, yeah. No, I appreciate that. And I think it's a great point because it's, 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 again, something that you said before that we don't have to compete. We don't have to go at it alone. We can be together. And I think sometimes that, that's, that's the power in, in asking for help. One of my former guests, Yosef, he was talking about that as well. The things, the things that changed the most in his life was the, was the time when he asked for help. That's how he started building his business. That's when he get out of, got out of his depression. That's when he starting living a life much, much more on his own terms. And I think it's it's that asking for help, getting the support, getting that perspective, change of perspective, which is sometimes uh, a person who's skilled in the art of listening and, and, you know, asking questions can support you in. Yeah, very good. Yeah. I agree. All right. Annika, is, Annika is, is, of course, saying that, yeah, 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 so nice to listen to you. Life coach is the thing. Uh, I'm happy that she's chiming in on this one. Do, do, well, do you know Annika? Yeah. No, no, you go. No, do you know Annika? Do you, yeah, do you know? I do. I do. Definitely. Definitely. She, The first time I met her was in Sweden. Uh, I was working for a pers um, personal trainer school, PT Distance. Uh, and Annika was front row. Um, uh, going through the training, she was taking notes all the time. She was super, super ambitious in this. And uh, I think she's got her own personal story around this, how her life transformed when she started asking these different questions in her life. Um, so maybe if Annika would be brave enough to get on here speaking English, I'd love her to uh, to share her story. But yeah, it's uh, definitely let's, let's powerful. Let's give a thumbs up um, for that. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. for sure. I'm all quiet now. <laughs> yeah, now she's scared. <laughs> so, John, okay. if uh, if people want to connect with you, I mean, you you do so many different things. Uh, and today you've shared about your course. You've shared about uh, Canary Green, and you know Canary PR. There there are different things that you do. If people want to connect with you, obviously we're we're sharing some of your links down here. Is there anything else you would like to add for people to connect with you? Uh, well, if you give my social, if you search my name, John Dale Beckley, not John Beckley, because John Beckley is an artist in America. And he's bullied me out of the search engines. <laughs> so, and I have to use John Dale Beckley on my full name. Yeah. But, um, yeah. And they can connect with you that way. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Cool. Good. Great. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Thank there you. we go. John Dale Beckley. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks. Well, thank you, John, very, very much for uh, being on the show. I really appreciated it. It was a, it was a good thank conversation you. to have. Yeah. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed the, it. I hope the listeners enjoyed it too. I, I'm few, sure they a few, did. A few people have actually asked me if this will be published afterwards so they can get a link. It will, definitely. So it's saved and, uh, you know, you can access the episodes on YouTube. So it's easy to share from there. So it's, it's saved. So, yeah, absolutely. And can you on YouTube block comments from my family? Are you able to do <laughs> No, <that>? no, <laughs> we're going to highlight them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Uh, sorry to say. Oh, well, Thanks. thank you very much, John. It was really nice having you. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you soon, yeah? Cheers. Bye-bye. All right, guys, thank you super much for, for joining in. I'm, I'm super stoked when people are uh, joining live like this. I'm, I'm really honored. Uh, this, is, this is the beauty with, uh, you know, of having a live show. Now, I hope this was useful, and I'm, I'm quite sure it was, uh, with, with my guest, John. And some of these things, I'm sure, might have touched a hot string or two. Uh, sometimes for the positive, sometimes maybe for uh, the, the slightly more challenging. And either way, if, if you did enjoy this or if you have more questions around this, do not hesitate to reach out to me or John. Comment uh, you know, down below this video if you're on YouTube or on Facebook. Uh, I'd I love to continue that conversation, so do not you know, hesitate to do so. Thank you very much for, um, for joining in on this one. And I, I would just want to say that next week we are meeting uh, Lola Morales. And she's a fantastic woman. Like, there is no way that I can present her, you know, make her justice. But let me just say, she's got this amazing transformation, personal transformation, where she realized that the, the most important thing she can make a stand for was to become herself. So um, that's a story that we're unpacking next week. And we do that on Wednesday, 6 p.m. London time. So you can join me live at, at that point. So if you're watching on YouTube, make sure that you lick, 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 there you go. Just because I'm trying to say this in a such a great way, click the subscribe button, like, and uh, also smash that uh, bell notification so you know when I go live. And on Facebook, please like my Facebook page. It's Adam Kavalik Life Coach. Well, thank you very much for uh, watching today. I really appreciate it. Catch you next week.